Okay, so in the final topic that we will be covering in the course is going to be family law. I mean, the fact that actually family law is kind of a variation and a continuation of civil law, but it still is substantially different nonetheless that it needs to be treated as a separate topic for all of our stakes. So we're going to be looking at the change of realities of Canadian families in the early 21st century in the realm of family civil law. So let's get started. Now, the introduction with family law kind of goes like this. Essentially, social and economic changes in Canada have been forcing um, changes of how and what we view as the quote-unquote traditional family unit. But essentially, family law or the family unit will include you know, the family, the spouse, and the marriage. It is also important that you understand that government jurisdiction over these matters and rights and responsibilities of these types of relationships. And now these relationships um, can be consulted and constituted, but also how they can be uh, dissolved. And that is the important part and an example of how family law has been drastically changing in recent years. And so there are some important terms with family law, starting with the Divorce Act, Family Law Acts, the various ones that is, separation agreements, divorce, annulment, family, marriage contracts, the old idea of alimony, the dower rights, and what constitutes as the matrimonial home. These are the important terms. So, to start with family law, what is a spousal couple? Essentially, a spousal couple is any two persons no matter if they are the same gender or opposite gender or who are living in a conjugal relationship, regardless whether or not they have been married. And that is the definition of a spousal couple. But the actual definition of a spouse can vary quite a bit um, there, but it is always one and one person. It is, no, it is never going to include more than two people. It is always just the two people, whether it's male, female, male, male, female, female, transgender, you get the idea. Now with the Divorce Act, it is a federal statute, so it is a law regulated only by Ottawa, and it is the same right across the country. It governs all divorces across the country. The Divorce Act also grants the court the power to make orders on subjects related to marriage, the dissolution, and the division of family property. As well as the Divorce Act uh, outlines a spousal couple is only a family unit under this act if they are legally married. Legally married means that the marriage has been legally recognized in Canada. Um, there are lots of examples where a marriage might have occurred in a different country, but for various uh, reasons, such as treaty considerations, um, the federal government uh, may not always recognize that marriage. And if a marriage does not exist, then it cannot be terminated, meaning um, cancelled, under the Divorce Act. Now, with the Family Acts, the, the Family Acts, unlike the Divorce Act, the Family Law Acts are provincial. Divorce is a federal. And the provincial acts deals with the division of property and may other aspects of the marriage breakdown. And the family law acts are now being amended to reflect the changes of what the federal definition is constitute for our marriage. One of the big things, of course, has changed in Canada from really the mid to late 1990s was same-sex marriages and common law marriages. The actual idea of family unit has definitely changed. Now, with family, the family under the law is any grouping of persons whose affairs are so closely related that they plan their personal finances or financial affairs together. That's one reason why family law is connected to civil law. With a family, it may be a single person, a spousal, 
same gender, opposite gender, single parent grouping or other groupings of more distantly related individuals, i.e. the extended um, family type of unit. Whereas a separation agreement is a contract between spouses in which they agree to live separate lives and live, live by a set of various conditions. It is governed by contract law and during the separation agreement, the separated spouses are still married legally, but they are no longer living together. And typically, so speaking, a separation agreement will last for one year before um, it can proceed over to the actual divorce proceedings. The idea of one year is basically a timeout, um, and it's highly encouraged that both sides would seek you know, counseling and other types of social services in the hope that the marriage could actually be um, rescued uh, there. Now, while the one year is common, there is one way to get around the one year requirement, and that is if one side did commit adultery and it's been proven and evidence of adultery, then the one year separation is no longer required. Now, with a divorce, a divorce is a formal and legal end to the marriage. Divorce is governed by the federal courts. And the divorce is granted by a court upon a, the application by a defender um, made by it. And then if the defender um, takes a claim, that means then the um, marriage is essentially contested and both sides will need to appear in court. Now, alimony is an actual old term they used to describe an allowance a man would pay to his former wife for her living costs, but he only had to pay if he had been guilty of adultery, cruelty, and or desertion. But in the time of liberal-minded thinking and being politically correct, the term alimony is no longer a politically correct uh, term that's used in Canada, but is still a commonly known term, but the actual term now is referred to as spousal support. Now with spousal support, it means that in the event of a marriage breakdown, each spouse has the obligation to assist the other spouse financially to the extent that the support is needed and can be afforded. A lot of times the spousal support it can be based upon who made the greater amount of income, the property, and most and most critically is are their children involved and if their children are involved what is the state of the matrimonial home and um, how long will it be until the kids are adults with marriage though marriage is like other contract and marriage confers upon the parties a special status that is prescribed by law and marriage may be contract based upon consent but unlike other contracts, it is public in nature, and one must state that as interest. And also marriage is defined historically as a voluntary union of a man and woman to the exclusion of any other person during the continuance of that union. Obviously now, um, same-sex marriages are very much legal in Canada, so it can be man, man, woman, woman, or man and woman. But the main point is that the marriage constitutes publicly the um, the exclusiveness of anyone else um, in this couple. Now, with the justification of marriage under the British North America Act of 1867, no, the BNA Act, the federal government was given the legislative responsibility for marriage and divorce. And because of the BNA Act going back to the founding of the Dominion of Canada, um, all provisions refers to marriage and divorce is the federal government, and because that is the same right across the country. There is no difference from one province to another province when it comes to marriage or divorce. Whereas the provincial provinces, though, each province has responsibility for legislation with respect to the solemnization of the marriage in that province. It has also enabled provinces to act their own preconditions to the solemnization of that marriage, so there is a little bit of variations to that. But it does make provision for religious and civil marriages ceremonies to be um, drawn uh, up and also various financial considerations.
Now that we mentioned common law, what it is. Common law is, refer is frequently used to describe a variety of different types of relationships. To constitute a common law marriage, a common law is necessary to marriage to be solemnized, so exclusive essentially. And is required is that there is an actual act of mutual agreement and consent to enter into a matrimonial relationship permanent and exclusive to uh, all others. And also the common law, though, it is not an actual, you don't have like the whole wedding kind of thing. It's just, you are living together, you have your finances together, you might have children together, you might have property, you're doing everything else, but for uh, whatever the reason might be, uh, you need a party wishes to enter into a marriage. And with common law, um, uh, now a couple can be considered a common law, um, as early as I believe the uh, nine months into the relationship of the two sides living together. There, that's another example of how um, family law has changed in um, recent years. The annulment of a marriage happens um, is different though from divorce. Annulment basically means. Uh, is a divorce decree that dissolves or terminates it, valid, may, uh, valid marriage for it. But annulment is basically a decree that states the marriage did not exist and that it was null and void on the basis of facts for whatever um, the reason uh, is. Essentially, a void marriage is one that regarded that the marriage never actually took uh, place, and because a, a true marriage never took place, um, it became an annulment or the voiding of that. Now, to get a voidable marriage, a marriage may be voidable because of impotence or a lack of consent from one side or a non-compliance of the various required statutory or statute formalities uh, from the federal government upon the registration of the attempted uh, marriage, i.e. You know, the wedding registry. With the void or avoidable marriages, though, uh, the determination of whether marriage is void or avoidable is important when it comes to the legitimacy of the children. When, when you often look at family law, it comes uh, down to what is the best um, interest, the best sake for the kids. If no marriage existed, i.e. it was a void, there is no right to, to a division of property under the provincial statute. If a marriage did not exist, then the rights of the marriage not be, be climbed. One thing that is a common trend in a Canadian society now is that before people either enter into a common law relationship or or an actual marriage um, for agreement, both sides will write up um, uh, their um, own, so essentially their finances. And I would say one thing that does become a more common trend now in Canada is um, there is a prenuptial agreement, and essentially a prenuptial agreement is made before a marriage, and this type of agreement is when both a uh, couple determines how they will divide their assets um, up should the marriage ever come to an end. But also a probate marriage will uh, lay out what each person had coming up to the agreement time as their own exclusiveness, so it may not always be um, their own property or finances, whatever it was, is their own before the actual agreement took place. So it would not be subject to the division of property and assets in the case of um, divorce. Now, with a marriage contract, all jurisdictions allow marriage contracts. They specify the rights and obligations for a spouse of breakdown. And the formal uh, requirements are it needs to be signed in writing, witnessed by both sides, and signed as well. Whereas maintenance and uh, support, there is a legislative jurisdiction where both the federal and provincial legislation is enforced with respect to maintenance and support of it. And matters of maintenance of divorced persons um, is the becoming divorced there. Federal legislation is paramount and the support of legislation of the subordinate there. There's also the spousal support uh, payments there. And the um, uh, eligibility of spousal support is based upon the length of time they cohabited together, the functions they did during the cohabitation, and any sort of agreement when it comes to the support of the spouse or child that might have come from that relationship. The types of models of support is clean break model, compensatory model, or the income security model. Now, once again, 
the, uh, the interests of the children and maintain a stable family home for the kids is vitally important. And with child support, there are principles of child support, or such as there's a little confusion about the principles. They include that children are entitled to a uh, material way of living standard that's close to what they had before, and that even so, the uh, parent spouse has a lower standard of living than what was previously enjoyed. And also, as spouse support for child support is the responsibility of both parents to support their minor children. There. And child support can reward to a child who is under the age of 16, but if over the age of 16 and over, um, it can be changed. Now, if they choose to remarry, the spouse of support usually stop when they, when one of the spouse remarries, either if they remarry together or they get married to someone else. The remarriage of the custodial parent may change the expenses of the children of the result and more marriage, and this could be taken into account of the application in the court to reduce the child payments. And with the type of child payments, there's the lump sum awards, periodic support, or a variation of the two above there when it comes to the type of payments and support that is provided. When it comes to uh, income tax for child support, child support is not taxable in the hands of receipt, but is normally of the custodial support, but paying the spouse cannot deduct child support from it. With uh, spouse support, spousal support orders can be done under both federal and provincial. The Divorce Act recognizes there are four types or obligations when it comes to spouse support, recognizing the economic advantage or disadvantage, the appropriation of spouse's financial consequences, reliving a economic hardships as a result of the marriage breakdown, and um, any sort of way to be self-sufficient when it comes to spousal support. We're doing a lot of numbers, a lot of math, a lot of things that really can only be settled um, in the court, which unfortunately does mean um, going through um, the breakdown and dividing up of the marriage and the family, the assets, it tends to be very expensive. Very, very, very expensive. Um, because of the court proceedings and the costs, um, and also no time taken. Whereas a division of property, there is much variation in provincial legislation when it comes um, to it. Um, you really just want to check out what what each province has, where the marriage took place, and where the living was done. The wife's dower right is a traditional right of dower at common law. Was the right the wife's right to a life interest in one third of all real property which the husband had ownership of. Today, however, women have rights of their own and deal with their own property and dower rights. So the dower rights actually are less important. Um, there in some provinces though, dower rights still exist, but the widow is required to elect um, between her right and a dower uh, on the bequest of her husband's uh, will. So there, there is, we essentially we get to it's our dower rights. This is where um, you absolutely need to have a lawyer and someone who you can trust and who's very much familiar um, with this matters. And this kind of thing, as I'm sorry, as you probably start to get the idea, does not go quickly. It's pretty slow. Whereas the division of assets acquired during the marriage, most provinces consider the marriage a form of a partnership that each spouse is entitled to 50% of the value of the assets shared during the marriage. And because of the, of the value of the assets, a ton of time of the marriage is kept by the spouse owning them be, uh, of it. So the value of property gifted to one spouse by a third party is kept by a by the receiver of the gift. In most jurisdictions, the increase in value of the property is taken into account for the marriage as shared property. So um, it's all about what is owned after you know, the big wedding day. Whereas common law, we don't have, uh, there is still like division of assets and property. It usually happens with common law, but it's, it's not clear, as clearly um, clean cut and precise as it is with marriage um, there. And common law uh, agreements can come to an end much, much quicker than a marriage can. Non-family assets, though, includes assets that are not generally used by the family, such as 
shares of, in private companies, investment portfolios, rental properties, in jurisdictions where only family assets are subject to division, these non-family assets remain with the owning spouse, and neither property nor the value is subject to division. So there is actually that kind of variation there. And the departures from equal sharing comes to very statutory provisions. Some provinces provide all the property required during the marriage to be subject to division. Others don't. Um, when it comes to discretion of the court, i.e. regarding uh, sharing, sharing with it, the um, discretion of the court will allow the unequal share of the assets is affected by um, the short childless. If there was no children in the marriage and the marriage was short or one side was providing more than the other was, um, if there was any inheritance given to the marriage, and if there was inheritance, where was the source and origins of the inheritance, and was there any unreasonable types of debts, um, consumer debts in particular that was incurred uh, during marriage. These are all things that are done at the discretion of the court. Let's get, you can see the price tag <laughs> for these court cases um, to happening there. And why actually there's fewer people getting married now and more entering into common law relationships. Now the last big, big piece when it comes to family law that we'll cover in this course is the matrimonial home. Now in Canada currently the matrimonial home is considered to be a family asset. Whether or not legislation provides for the division of all the assets acquired during marriage or a restricted category of assets known as family assets, the matrimonial home itself is a shared property, the actual building or unit or structure itself. Now the possession of the matrimonial home comes down to the ownership and possession of it. First, the law recognizes that the marital status itself provides interest into the property, the right to remain in possession of it, especially if there is children there. The jurisdictions provide the right for the possession of it, and as often as necessary when a spouse with um, inter custody of children needs to remain in the house with the kids, so then the kid, the children that are in that marriage can have like as close as they can as a stable um, family living conditions until they um, reach age of 16 or and finish uh, high school. Right? That's the matrimonial home. But there is restrictions on the possession of it. Courts are reluctant to order the exclusive possession of the matrimonial home unless there are circumstances uh, for it. You know, crime is often one. There's also no legislation in Canada which uh, a court will order a party out of home uh, at the request of other party unless there are circumstances where a court deems it uh, continued re uh, residents on, under the same roof as a danger and will not interfere with the spouse of it. Uh, essentially, the second point is if the marriage, as an example, if the marriage uh, broke down and there might have been some reports, say, of domestic violence or um, there was peace bonds or restraining uh, orders or the police have been called, um, essentially, is a place safe or not to have everyone still there or for insert this reason why someone the one of the priorities will need to leave when it comes also the restrictions of the disposition most provinces restrict the disposition of the matrimonial home however in some it is required that both spouses the one registered on title and the untitled spouse sign a document mortgaging the home a uh, dog may intend to transfer to sell the property, sometimes to the court. And that province's interest in the property of the non titled spouse crystallizes only when a spouse has committed an application or commenced an application under the, the property legislation. In those provinces, there is no consent required to the marriage or to mortgaging or even sale of, the, of it. There, whereas restrictions on the position are intended to prevent one spouse from disposing of assets in anticipation of the separation. Essentially, um, what kind of happens sometimes is as both people are spouses that are still legally married, but they are in the separation agreement stage, so they're not living together. Whoever might still be uh, living on the house in the original matrimonial home. And who has the title, you know, who signed the contract to purchase the home, may try to sell it um, so uh, to kind of get the maximum amount of money <laughs> before the court case. That's where the whole restriction comes in.
Now, the myth is upper public division is a, is a share of ass, assets from the province to province. Some provinces deem all property as assets to pool together 50%. Others may not. There, So it really depends on what province you are living in and or where the wedding took place. But there are some key aspects when it comes to division of property. First, because the legislation it varies from province to province and subject to change. Um, there, most people don't usually keep up with it. That's why the lawyers are involved. Also, aspects of division of property is critical that a spouse owning the business determine the extent to which the equalization payment of property will have a various effect on the ongoing business. The most effective way is to limit the equalization payment. Though well, there is sometimes some financial disclosure which is required um, for it. And with the uh, division of property, the provincial legislation will determine whether the property is divided or whether money payment is going to be made. It is critical that options will respect the division that is ex explored there. And the division of property on the national breakdown is complicated and, then, and very involved uh, asset. Essentially, the idea of like the matching on your home is another area that has changed quite a bit um, in the Canadian family uh, law uh, there. Even now, like even they have spouses that are living, um, ex-spouses that are still living on the same home unit or home, matching on home, that the kids are there, but they are in, Everyone, the everyone, in the family are still like living in the same house, but they are not. The the, the adults, the parents, are not living that um, exclusive um, relationship. You now they they might sleep in separate bedrooms, as an example, and they would file their own taxes as CRA separately. And um, on the CRA will indicate that they are separate, but they still are living in that shared matrimonial home for the sake of the kid, for the children until they reach that certain age. And last but not least is the division of family assets. Family assets or the value of it are subject to, um, to division in all jurisdictions. And family assets have been defined as property owned by one or both spouses and ordinary used by a spouse or minor child of your spouse there. Um, except in some provinces will include the sharing of it, um, the bank accounts, uh, pension plans, home ownership, or even retirement saving plans. So to summarize, the purpose of this was to get you familiar with it, how what happens when it breaks uh, down, and you definitely need to have a good financial plan. The end, but you can also check this if you want to have additional information.